You know, there is probably uh, no scripture, that, at least that I'm aware of in the Bible, that is more rich with meaning than the one found over in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. And there's no reason to turn that. I think all of you probably have it memorized. At least you know what it says. But it does say, and God said, this is just not all of it, let us make man in our image. So certainly we know from that that each of us are created in the very image of God. There's a scripture over in Isaiah in chapter 64 and verse 8 that sort of carries on you know, with this same theme, but not exactly in the same way. It says, but now, O Lord, you are our father. We are the clay and you are potter and we are all the work of your hand. We were all created in the image of God, and we are certainly the work of his hand. So as each of us, as the clay in the hand of the potter, our father, we have but one required occupation, one required job in this life. And that is to, in all that we do, in all that we say, and in all that we think, to please the potter, to please our father. I think each of you are familiar with the scripture that is called over in Matthew chapter 6, the Lord's Prayer. It's not really the Lord's Prayer. It's more of an example prayer, a sample prayer. But there is a scripture over in Matthew chapter 26 in verse 42 that, again, I think we're all familiar with in when Christ was praying and what is, in effect, the real Lord's Prayer. I'm just going to read one verse of Matthew chapter 26 and verse 42. It says, He went away again, the second time, and prayed, saying, O my Father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. In other words, as you're familiar with the situation, he said, you know, he would prefer it not to be, but nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Every moment, and in respect of everything that we say, everything that we do, we must also say like Christ did. Like the prophets of old, like Paul, like all those who profess to be truly Christ's disciples. Nevertheless, not my will be done, but thy will be done. Now, you know, that's easy enough to say. Comes off the tongue real easy. But the actual doing of that is just a little bit more difficult. It's not something that probably most of us think about on a day-to-day -day basis. And that's okay in one sense of the word, but it's something we need to be aware of and constantly aware of. <clears throat> I think it's self-evident to say that we should all know and, and understand that we should and do love God. And certainly there is no greater expression of that love, no greater uh, indication of that love and example of that love than a totally, freely submitted will to God. In Hebrews chapter 13, and verse 20, it says, Now the God of peace make you perfect in every good work to do his will. Who is the his there? It's our potter. It's our father. Working in you, we, the clay, that which is well-pleasing in his, again, the potter's sight. So, you know, when we strive in whatever capacity it is, whatever way, whatever situation, to do God's will, it is not only, as the scripture says, well-pleasing to God to do that, but it helps us to perfect our works. As it says up there, makes you perfect in every good work to do his will. Now, I think I can say confidently that everyone in this room prays. Maybe not as often, maybe not as long, as frequently as we should, but we pray. We pray for different things. We pray for um, divine deliverance. We pray for those, as we had mentioned in the uh, announcements, for those that are ill, members of our family, members of our church family. We pray for help in, in all the activities we, you know, we, we participate in. We pray for many, many different things. But think about our prayer. How often do we, within our prayer, truly pray, as you will, Father? 
sometimes in our prayers it's a litany of things that I need, things that I want, things that you know other people need or whatever. But think about it when we are praying. Are you praying as you will? I think there are times when we pray in that manner, no question about that. I think all of us do. But I think there are also times when it is not our primary mindset when we go before God. And yet, I don't think we're being so much uh, in a defiant attitude, but maybe just sometimes we are a little bit oblivious. Maybe we have forgotten, a little bit absent-minded, careless, or maybe even distracted. Because there are a lot of distractions in this world. There's a lot of things that we get preoccupied with, a lot of things that happen in our lives from day to day that keep us distracted and away from God. It's very easy for that to happen. We live in a world full of distractions, in case you haven't noticed. There's not very much that goes on in this world around us today that is God-centered. It's totally God or against God in that sense of the word. To me, personally, may not be for you, but to me personally, two of the most prevalent distractions can be, if we're, we allow them to be, is a cell phone and email. Now, when I used to work on a regular basis day to day, if I paid attention to my email, I didn't get any work done because it's, it's, it's ubiquitous. It's always there and there's always something to be done on it. So I had to set up a schedule where I worked email and I was corresponding at that particular time with people from all over the world. And you know, the different time frames, that's one good thing about email. It can, you, you can allow it to, to work then. You don't have to answer the telephone right then. Now, while I am not at all against either one of these very modern, in one sense of the word, in the, in the history of the world, modern, uh, communication technologies, I do think they have helped to produce, in most of us, a gradual fragmentation of what I call personal relationships. Um, with family, with friends, uh, and maybe, think about it, possibly even our personal relationship with God. I think there are those today that would prefer to, if they could, communicate with their iPhone with God. Now, you know, it's, it's sort of funny if you think about it, but if you think about it, I don't know how many people you know, there are some people I know that will go without almost everything but their iPhone. If they're going to go somewhere, they may forget to carry whatever else they need to carry, but they'll have their iPhone with them. If they don't, they'll turn around and go back and get it. Now, if you've not been around people like that, then maybe you're fortunate. Um, but it's, it's a situation where sometimes some people are beginning to spend probably more time with their cell phone than they do with people. Have you ever noticed if you go to the store, people are walking up and down the aisles, they're on a cell phone. You go to a restaurant, People aren't even talking to one another. They're sitting there texting. You know, here we go. I can't do it. I, I can imitate, but I can't do it. Or they get a, you know, an email message that comes in the phone. These, what they call smart smartphones today. <clears throat> now, I'm not putting anybody down. Okay, don't don't worry. It's not. It's just a general conversation about the situation. They have become so smart, as it were, with apps that you can do almost anything and everything on them. They have replaced, for all practical purposes, in many cases, computers. Because you can do everything on one of them that you can do on a computer. And you, know, you can hold them in your hand. Their iPads and their iTablets and, you know, my old computer's a clunker compared to all that. They're just, it's amazing, the technology that has come along. But I think what it has done, if we're not careful, if we don't think about it, it can interfere with the development of our own personal relationships because we spend so much time on the telephone. Now, it's fun. I understand that. There are games you can play. You can access the Internet from your iPhone. And uh, somebody may think I'm attacking the iPhones. Uh, I'm not. Uh, but I want us to be aware of the fact that we as human beings need human contact. We need individual personal relationships with one another. And it, it's a little bit disconcerting if you go somewhere with someone and you expect to have a conversation and they're constantly on their phone. I have experienced this. I don't think any of them are listening, but my own grandchildren. We go out to dinner, 
sometimes, and somebody has to tell them to put their phones down because they're keeping up a constant conversation with someone, somewhere, somehow, someplace, and it's just an ever-going situation. That, that didn't happen even 10 years ago. It's a change in the way we do life, you might say. It's a way that, that we need to be very aware of. Our relationships are gradually being reduced to little snippets of conversation in between text messages or telephone calls because we're constantly interrupted with all the different communication devices that some people carry. Although, like I said, anymore with some of these newer phones, it's the only thing you need to carry. Yet at the same time, most of us probably, unless we have really concentrated on it, are even not even aware of what we're losing. I read an article some time ago that described this phenomenon as what was called availability addiction. Availability addiction. Now, I do not personally, uh, and that's me, have my cell phone on. I don't turn it on unless I leave the house. If I leave the house and I'm traveling somewhere, I have it with me. And then, of course, you're dependent upon service if you don't have service where you go, but I, that's the only time I cut it on. I don't use it otherwise. Um, I only look at my email anymore if I cut on the computer for other purposes because it can be very time-consuming, very time-wasting. Now, there are times, of course, when we need you know, to be able to get a hold of people. But what did people do when they didn't have cell phones? You know, somehow or another we lived. Somehow or another we made it. I'm not sure how because some, there are people today that cannot survive without their iPhone. And I won't name any names. I'm, I'm not looking at anybody in here because uh, I don't know whether you've got one or not. Mine's a dumb phone. <laughs> See, it's a dumb phone. All it does is make telephone calls, but it gets me what I need to do. It, it will take a picture too, though. I forgot that. By the way, is anybody's cell phone on? It's gotten to the point where we have to, at weddings, I've done this before, and at funerals, and at the beginning of church services, to ask people to please cut off their cell phones so they won't ring, because we carry them with us, and they're, they're everywhere. I'm not looking at anybody. I don't know if any of you do or don't, so it doesn't really matter. I think sometimes we have come to the point where we simply think the world, in effect, cannot go on without our involvement in it. But, you know, it was refreshing to be able to go up to the mountains in New Mexico and not have cell phone service. It, it's one of the few places I've ever gone that I haven't had it. Um, but there were places, there were times where we didn't have it. You just say, no service, you know, nobody here, nobody listening, nobody can get a hold of you. Um, <clears throat> I've seen people, unfortunately, carry cell phones into deer blinds. Hey, you're supposed to be out here deer hunting. But we have this issue that we can't seem to let go of that we've got to be connected with the world out there. But if you'll think about it, and there's some folks in here with, you know, a few years on them, years ago we didn't have that luxury, and somehow or another we have made it to this age. I'm not sure how we survived, but we did. Because there are people today, especially those, and anymore if you get a family that has several teenagers in it, one, two, three, or four, whatever. Hopefully not four for anybody. Uh, that's more than any soul could, could handle, I think. Uh, everybody has a cell phone. And if you don't have a plan that allows unlimited text, unlimited data, and unlimited you know, telephone calls, then you know, you're, just, you're just not up with it. You're just not in the now generation. Uh, it's not cool not to have that. So... We've come to the point where we just are so involved with that. It, it just it seems it's everywhere you go. As I said, I've seen people in their cars, which is really, you know, they're making more and more laws against that. But And it, it's they have an ad on TV. You've probably seen it. It shows a little message of two or three words, and this was the message that someone was texting at the time somebody else was killed in a car accident because they were looking down at their, their cell phone. Restaurants, grocery stores, everywhere you go, even in bathrooms, can't even go in there. I remember several years ago, I was in a restroom, and someone came in, and they were talking. I turned around to see if they were talking to me. Oh, they were on their cell phone. A uh, guy I used to work with, and this was years ago, and the two offices, that we, um, two bathrooms that we had in the office, he installed telephones in both of them. That was before cell phones. Had to have, you know, you can't get away from them in that sense of the word. Now, you know, if that's what you want, okay, but uh, we need to watch that. Some people, when they're at the restaurants, as I've said before, they're, they're not even talking to each other. They're just sitting there 
texting, playing with some kind of app on their telephone. And there's some amazing applications on these telephones that they put on there now. Uh, the so-called, as I said, smartphones do anything and everything that you could even imagine. Um, cell phones have become, or however you want to describe them, ubiquitous. They're everywhere. I mean, I don't know how many thousands or millions of them are sold every day. But lots of companies depend on them greatly. Now, partially, only partially, as a result of this availability addiction, as it was described, but also as a result of, of many, many other distractions <clears throat> that can come about in our lives, there are times when we are just not really sure, I think, what God wants us to do. So in effect, we try to muddle through on our own because we have lost our connectivity to God. Now, is a cell phone the sole reason of that? No, absolutely not. It's a tool rightly used, just like the way things have changed in the communication fields and the technology of, of mass electronics and mass media. We're able to do things today in the preaching of the gospel message that we simply weren't able to do 10, 15, 20 years ago. The Internet is a powerful tool for the preaching of the gospel message. And it's something that we use you know, correctly. It's very, very, very powerful and very, very good. <coughs> when we start to muddle through on our own, we, we lose that connectivity that we need to have with God. And as such, I think we lose sight of thy will be done. There are other times in our lives when we simply, I think, choose not to pray. Thy will be done. Most of you are familiar with the author C.S. Lewis. Uh, he's written several different books. One quote that he had, uh, or one comment that he made in one of his books, and I forgot now which one it was. I should have looked it up, but I, I didn't. He wrote that every person must eventually adopt, adopt <clears throat> one of two postures before God, either what he termed joyful surrender. In other words, thy will be done. Or defiant separation. In other words, my will be done. Either joyful surrender or defiant separation. And the reality is, at least to some degree, that becomes our position on many things that we do. Many things that we think about in our lives. As, as we make a choice, and we come up, you know, we're coming up with choices all the time in our life. We have choices from what will I do next and what's the next thing I'm going to do? How will I treat this person that I'm talking to? And I'm not sure how you think about it, but if we're, you know, if we're sitting there talking to someone and we're spending most of our time texting or talking to someone else on a cell phone or getting an email you know, in the middle of it and answering the email, we're not being very personable, very respectful, uh, to do things like this. And as I said, I think there are some people today who would rather be able to communicate with God through text messages on their iPhone. Uh, makes it a lot more simple. But we lose that personal connection, and I think, unfortunately, too many of us have already lost it. Not that we've lost it forever, but we have lost it to a certain level, and we need to do whatever it is we need to do in order to get it back. We come up with temptations that come up to, uh, to us in our lives, different things that happen. <clears throat> and either we choose God's will or we choose our will when we do that. And the closer we are to God, the more connectivity we have had with him on a regular basis. <clears throat> Praying once a month is not going to get the job done. Praying once a week is not going to get the job done. I said regular personal connection with God on a regular basis. Are we going to follow God's will or are we going to follow our will? When we submit ourselves to the potter, because don't forget, we are the clay. Whether the task be small or it be great, it makes a big difference in how we do that. A lady by the name of Anne Lamott, uh, she's written several different books, wrote this particular quote, Hopefully everyone knows what the Gulf Stream is. It's the body of air that flows down, goes down toward the Gulf sometimes. It's a very powerful weather phenomenon. But she says the Gulf Stream 
can pass through a straw if the straw is properly aligned with the Gulf Stream. The analogy she was drawing, she said in the same way, God's Holy Spirit is available to us if we are aligned with God, if we are in connection with Him. But if our angle is off just a little bit, we're not going to have that connectivity. If we're thinking about something else, if we're going in a different direction, if our mind is somewhere else, then we're not going to have that same connection. And God's Holy Spirit cannot flow through us <clears throat> if we're not properly aligned with God. If we have not surrendered our will to Him, if we are not submissive to Him and to His will, and if we pray and actually live in our life, Thy will be done. Then the Holy Spirit can flow through us. In John chapter 7, verse 38, it said, He that believes on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. If we truly believe on him and what he can do in our lives, what he has called for us to do in this world, then we shall have those rivers of living water flowing through us if we are properly aligned with him. You know, sometimes we simply forget no question about that. Just simply forget to surrender our will to God. But yet at the same time, I think without actually thinking about it and making a conscious decision to do so, although that can happen as well, we simply refuse to. Then the sense of guilt, the sense of remorse, can cut us off from God and the flow of His Holy Spirit. One small example of this happened to me recently. And I think something like this has probably happened to every one of us at one time or another. Uh, there's a lot of construction going on around in, in the area, and I was heading over toward uh, Athens, and uh, a gentleman, I use the word conservatively, uh, you know, where two lanes will merge down to one, came screaming up on one side and cut over and almost ran me off the road. Well, instinctively, I hit my horn. To, number one, let him know I was there, but yet at the same time, number two, let him know I wasn't pleased with his actions if I'm truthful about the situation. It was an instinctive reaction that I did. He instinctively reacted with a gesture that was not appropriate in any circumstance. Uh, thankfully, by that time, I had gotten a hold of myself and did not you know, react in another way, but just simply you know, kept the brakes on and slowed down a little bit before I got into the ditch. But that's what I'm saying is that if we're not closely connected with God, we never know where the situation is going to come that we're going to react in a wrong way. And it can cost us a lot in many, many ways. You know the feeling that comes over you in that kind of a situation, at least it does to me, in the pit of your stomach, frustration, anger at the other person, but yet at the same time, a little bit of disappointment in self of how we know we should react as opposed to how we do react. It's a matter of the clay being responsive to the potter. Was it my way or is it God's way? Is it thy will be done or is it my will be done? I think sometimes we simply do not allow God's Holy Spirit to be the dominant influence in our thoughts and our actions the things that we say, the things that we do. And each one of us chooses sometimes, like C.S. Lewis said, to either surrender or resist. What do we do in our life? Do we surrender God to God or do we resist Him? The one who surrenders prays, Thy will be done. The person who resists says, in effect, Leave me alone. Get out of my life. And you know, God will answer both of those prayers. God will answer both of those prayers and will grant us our petition, including the fact of leaving us alone, if that's what we ask. Unfortunately, it seems like that's what the United States of America is doing today, as we see more and more examples of where we're just saying, God, get out of our life. We don't need you. We don't want you. We don't need you at all. We don't need your presence with us. You know, King Saul, early in his life, surrendered. But later in his life, he became distracted 
Now, obviously, he wasn't distracted by some of the same distractions that we're distracted by. I don't think he had a cell phone. Uh, don't think they had email. Most of the me messengers were by individuals. But, you know, he shut his heart to God. And in turning from God, he became one who resisted. Think about the story of Moses. In spite of all the many good things that Moses did, he had a few shortcomings as well. Did he, and I think he did, finally in the end, surrender and say, Thy will be done. But you remember what happened at the waters of Meribah? He was not able to enter the promised land as a result of that. One little slip, you might call it, whatever you want to call it, but I'm sure it was more than just one little slip. It was a total attitude and, and everything else that went along with it. The scriptures don't give us enough information, but it's enough to know the way God works to know that that was not just one little accidental slip that caused that. Solomon, a man reputed to be the wisest man to ever live, surrendered to God in the beginning, but he too became distra distracted. He resisted God. But in spite of the most, you know, one of the most well-known scriptures in the Bible, in Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13, again written by Solomon, he said, Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. What was it? Fear God. Keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. But at the same time, Solomon's end uh, was not too pretty. In other words, we must be fully and completely and totally surrendering ourselves and our will to God. Actually, nothing else works. If we're withholding from God, then it's not working right. David, we all know the story of David, in spite of his many human foibles, was one who finally also surrendered to God and said, Thy will be done. The scriptures describe him as a man after God's own heart. And I know each and every one of us probably wish that that's something that could be said of us, that thy will be done. But, you know, that came only after he had surrendered his will, and only after he began to pay more attention to what he was doing. Obviously, <clears throat> Christ himself is by far the ultimate example. Continually and completely saying in his life, always saying, as it says in John chapter 5 and verse 30. And he said, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge. My judgment is just, because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. John chapter 8 and verse 28 says, I do nothing of myself, but only as my Father has taught me. And finally in John chapter 4 and verse 34 he says, my meat, or my work, my, what I want to do, is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish the work. To finish the work. Is this our meat? Is this what we want? Is this where we're going? Is this our sustenance? Have we truly surrendered our will to God? Do we strive to do God's will, and to finish the work that he's given to each of us to do? <clears throat> Many people over the years have believed that the uh, real power of the Holy Spirit is reserved for those who have become a spiritual giant, for, not, uh, for lack of a better word to express that. The truth of the matter is, is that people don't become spiritual giants and then receive the Holy Spirit. We receive the Holy Spirit and then through the power of the Holy Spirit, we change our lives spiritually when we surrender ourselves unto God. You know, we can remember the exploits of someone like a John the Baptist or Paul when we talk about, you know, spiritual giants. But you remember Paul had a different name before he was Paul. He was Saul. Then he was going down the road to Damascus, and he had a, shall we say, a, a lightning an enlightening as well. And Paul changed his life and went in another direction. You remember the story of Rahab, the harlot? I mean, this lady was a harlot, okay? But she chose to help God, to help those that he had sent into the land, 
to hide them at the risk of her own life. And, you know, she risked her life to save the lives of others. She aligned herself or realigned herself to go with the way that God was going. And as a result, in James chapter 2 and verse 25, it says, Likewise, also, was not Rahab the harlot justified by works? The things that she did, the things that she did in her life to show that she was aligned with God. She surrendered to God in spite of the danger to herself. How about the story of Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus is described not in terms that we would normally want to be described. Now, there's nothing wrong with some of them, but he was rich. Okay, that, that's okay. Nothing wrong with that. But he was chief among the publicans, and he was a sinner. That's the way the scriptures describe Zacchaeus. Rich, chief among the publicans, and a sinner. And I don't know what has happened to my nose, but it is about to itch off. I'll hopefully get through this. But he was never described anywhere as a spiritual giant. Yet it says in Luke chapter 19 and verse 9, And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house. Because he was willing to completely surrender to God, to change his ways, not to follow his will, but to follow the will of God as it was revealed to him, as the help was given to him. There's a scripture over in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, that I think describes or summarizes this thought as well as any. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 5, it says, Casting down, and that word could better be rendered probably to destroy, imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Destroy in our lives everything and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and then to bring into captivity. When you bring someone into captivity, what do they do? They surrender. Bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So, you know, when each of us come into situations where we might have a wrong thought, we're tempted with a, a wrong action, uh, something happens and we want to react with the wrong words, Remember, our job is to please God. We are the clay. He is the potter. We are to pray and we are to live. In our life, thy will be done. Our job is not to resist, but to surrender and to finish the work. In Acts chapter 4, in verse 31, it says, And when they had prayed, breaking into the thought, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they spoke the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. The great power to finish the work, to carry on what was given to them to do, to submit themselves totally unto God and surrender unto Him. What is your meat? What is your job? How are we doing in our lives? Are we praying and living our lives according to thy will be done? Are we surrendering ourselves totally to God each and every day? Are we striving to help finish the work that we've all been called to do? And so to please God. There is a, a song in our hymn book called I Surrender All. And the refrain from that particular hymn begins and ends with just that. I surrender all. I surrender all. So how are we doing each and every day in our life, in every way? Are we surrendering our all?